Well, my dear friends, my dear forest explorers, we have arrived at the very end of this novel. Yes, the end. So I'm sure you're dying to know <laughs> what I thought about it in case you're not on my Discord where I've been, um, uh, let's say, sharing my opinions. But, but, uh, I will try to save my opinions till the very end of this video to the wrap up because I know you're anxious to get through um, the actual synopses of every chapter, are you not? But I will give you my thoughts as always as we progress through this final video, through every single chapter. Let us begin with chapter 30. The silver bell rang, and again its glitter rained into the lower part of Sidrius's dwelling. He told Sidrius to come in peace and talk gently with him, to find the answers he wanted. Now this is, uh, being, this is uh, Neb Nebsuel, I believe his name is, who is summoning Sidrius with his little, um, his little bird messenger, right? But singing somewhere in the beige, vague world outside of his sleep, there was singing. It is all well, master. You are well, and you are safe. Jungali, he said feebly, being Ishmael, touching his bandaged head again. And Nebzuel orders him to hold him down. The last layers of leaves and bandage might hurt when I take them off. With a stained mass in his hands, Nebzuel silently studied his handiwork. It is good, young master. Welcome to the mundane world of normal men. And Ishmael wanted a mirror, but he was, of course, denied. Not yet. I am leaving to fetch provisions, news, and wine. But Ishmael, though in pain, refused the pain-killing potion that uh, Nebzuel gave him. He wanted to focus on whom and what he knew and who he was ready to become. So now that uh, old Ishmael is happily the owner of two eyeballs, he just wanted to be a real boy, everybody. He just wanted to be a real boy. And so he's, he, he wants to dwell on the pain. He doesn't want to have a, uh, a dulled mind, one might say, so he can fully process this transformation. And Sungali was cooking in a small alcove behind a hanging carpet. But he hears something outside and he thinks it's Nebzuel. But the wrong kind of silence greeted his statement. Is there somebody here? But midway down the old man's body, a small silver fish twitched and shivered. It was growing in length. And Sungali, seeing his master stare, looked down at the point where the bright blade protruded from his chest. Behind him in the shadow stood a man with a floating white melon head. This is interesting. I've always wondered what Sidrius looked like. And here we go. He is a, um, a floating white melon head, apparently. And this is, I know they've mentioned it a little bit earlier, but I should have known Sungali was always older, but I don't remember it ever being described to us in that way up until the moment when, um, when Ishmael is, uh, is observing him. Don't scream. Open your mouth and I will open your throat. Answer my questions quietly. Where is Nebzuel? He is out buying wine. Don't lie to me, freak. Why would he trust you and this old dog alone in his home? He has been operating on both of us. So clearly Sungali is dead. Or is he, right? Uh, a huge problem I have with this novel. And I know, you know, I guess thematically it makes sense, but... I don't know. When people die in a book, I feel like they need to be dead. And this was an interesting scene. It was, um, I didn't ca quite catch the description. It was a little bit um, unclear to me as, as what this silver fish was on his chest um, until it was finally described as being a sword stabbed through Sungali. But even Ishmael doesn't really process it very much. And, and that's what's interesting about this book. I think in general is that um, a lot of things happen and the processing of those things is really strange. It's not exactly what what I would have imagined. Did you injure or kill the bowman? Uh, do you mean one of the Williams? We left him in the vault. He, he left without us. And the bow? He, he gave it to me. I will have the truth. There's a sharp metallic click from across the room. Twelve grams of splinter round at four meters. Put the blades down where I can see them, old friend. So Nebzuel has returned. And he has... <laughs> He's uh, given Sidrius a little bit of uh, something special. Very slowly, old friend. I know your ways and I am not alone, but it was you who summoned me here. Yes, but I was wrong and so were you to slay a man in my house. Put your hands in the noose. There is no need for this, you can trust me. Put your hands in the noose. You are attempting your death and you know I will do it. And so he strings him up, essentially. You hang between two great wooden drums. If you displease me, you will be mangled through them and crushed to a rag before you can take a breath. Do you understand me? Now tell me exactly what weapons and charms you have about your person. And this is when Nebzuel uh, finally gives him, gives him his medicine. 
I have given you forty hours to get back. I sent the black dove to your abode a quarter of an hour ago. It carries my last supply of the vital antidote for Mithrasia toxia, the spore of which you sucked from my rifle a few minutes ago. Sidrius was speechless for a moment, and then bolted for the door. Pray there are no hawks in the skies between us, shouted Nebswell at the swinging door. Neither started to clear up and remove the sad, scarred body of the old black warrior, being Sungali. Sungali sat with his grandfather, so here we are, uh, during the five days of a purification, so there is a, a ceremony, allegedly. But he did not know that he had, who had killed him. He did not know it was Sidrius. He needed his ghost in that world for a while longer to protect Ishmael until he had reached his home. Another strange thing about the character interactions here is that we do know that when um, one of the Williams gave the bow to Ishmael, um, he's the master of Sungali now for some reason. And Sungali is like, yeah, sure, whatever. I mean, I, I know it's a magical bow and stuff, but just again, the the character dynamics of the way they interact and, 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 and react to each other essentially is just, it's a little bonkers. It, it's like the, yeah, just the character dynamics don't feel realistic to me. But the days pass quickly. With each better than the last, he gained strength and learned much from Nebsuel, being Ishmael. The face became plain and Ishmael practiced with it. Nothing had been heard of Sidrius, though. An unexpected friendship grew between the unlikely pair. Ishmael announced that it was time for him, unfortunately. Uh, to leave and find its place in the world. Seems to be a common occurrence with Ishmael, right? He kind of goes from uh, one place to the next, trying to uh, figure out how he fits into this whole thing. But the night before Ishmael's departure, when they heard the impatient ghost moving back and forth outside, Sungali, Do ghosts ever sleep? Ishmael found himself asking. Uh, yes, but, but not the sleep of men. Theirs is an emptier kind of slumber. If an erstwhile and a willing human entered the condition, and seal themselves away from the world, they become something else, something quite different, without form, like a memory, a tangible genie of the place where they hide. It is even said that the spirit of the forest himself is composed of such an unmitigating force, that the black man of many faces is held together by it. So, we know this. We saw the uh, tapestry or sculpture or painting or something in the church. But the next morning they embraced in the doorway. They vowed to meet again. And part it. Which brings us to chapter 31 and um, My Bridge, My Bridge, the worst character in the entire book uh, for reasons that I will uh, I will get to at the very end. But My Bridge was beginning to feel his age, not in a parting sense. He was strong. He was becoming aware of how much work there was to do and how little time he had left to do it in. Almost every day he was talking in public, producing interviews and articles, a man on display. It had been after his meeting with Edison, of course, here we go, another historical link, where they had discussed the possibility of adding sound to moving images. To his amazement, nothing had ever come from the Winchester coffers. The mad old woman hadn't given him a bean. So, a pointless part of the book, completely pointless. Um, you know, it's not even like a red herring kind of thing. It's like, it's like it felt to me like Catelyn just wanted to, um, thought the Winchester story was cool, and he's like, hey, how can I fit it into my book? And that's what he did, and to absolutely... No significance whatsoever. Mybridge didn't even learn anything from the event. Anyway, anyway, moving on. He had read Mr. Dickens' story and recognized many coincidental features of his own life in it. So Brian Catling, he loves to just reference things from the real world and pull them into, uh, you know, his own novel, which, you know, maybe he's, he, he must be intimately familiar with this stuff. And so, uh, you know, they always say, write what you know. Well, Brian Catling is definitely doing it literally. But she had sold cameras and bought a passage back to her origins. She was in Africa with a sun and heat. So that being Josephine, the woman that um, gave him a prostate exam, one might say. As he touched the gears again, he felt oil on his fingertips. He looked closer. There was wear on the head strap. Somebody had used it, not once, but a number of times. So you're starting to kind of become interested. Okay, well, what does this mean? Not really anything. Uh, but yeah, somebody had been using his device in the dead of night. He was a world famous celebrity though now. Uh, others were taking photographs of him, so he's quite pleased with his accomplishments. But then he saw an impossible sitting on the audience and staring directly at him. Gull, he was supposed to be dead. So honestly, this chapter is really kind of it's filler, man. I, I don't I don't get I don't get the Mybridge storyline. And we know, spoiler, spoiler. Well, it's not a spoiler because you've read along with me. Uh, he dies, and it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Which brings us to chapter 32. Essenwald had changed. Ishmael sensed it the moment he entered the outskirts. And he shaded his face 
from the crowd. He was not used to yet not yet used to showing himself op- openly, which makes a lot of sense. Um, Nebzul's work uh, must be damn good, right? <laughs> but the way it was described is funny because I imagine a cyclops was something in the middle of their eye, and he kind of shifted it a little bit, I guess. And then I remember him saying that uh, his eyes would be really close together just because that's what he had to do because he only he only started with one. Uh, but the strange thing is, is again, character reactions. Nobody really thinks it odd. I, I know, I, I believe Serena mentions how he looks and how he has kind of a pinched face, but I, I don't know. It, it's really hard for me to visualize. I, I figure this, this, this medicine man kind of shaman in, in the middle of the vor, he, um, or maybe he's not in the vor, but anyway, he's, he's near the vor and he, <laughs> I don't know. It feels like it would be pretty crude, but maybe not. Maybe not. I don't know. This book, like I said, lots of problems with me anyway. But his instinct was to head for Four Cooler Brunin because he's got two ladies, right? Well, one lady who lives there. He doesn't know about the other one yet. But since the Lomboya had vanished, only a dribble of trees were left in the forest. So this is when the uh, the timber, you know, the timber business is just falling apart, and we learn more about that from um, uh, Gertrude's. We finally meet G- Gertrude's family, her, her mom and her dad, and um, so we learn about how that's affected them and, and where they're going. But Ishmael was lost. He had walked past the same garden four times in two hours. But then he realizes he was on the street of the owl, the woman he slept with on the night of the uh, the masquerade. But a dim, absent little man came to the gate and peered through. Hey, yes, may I speak with the mistress of the house? What is your business with Mistress Law, sir? It's private, quite private. She will know me. Your name, sir? Uh, please t- tell her it's Ishmael from the night of the carnival. Mistress Law will not be able to help you, sir. Be off with you. Be off. What's wrong, Jim? <laughs> Gui Pax? Gui Pa? I don't know. Tell me in the comments. I should have looked it up. How to pronounce that. Uh, but um, called Serena from the balcony. Uh, nothing, ma'am. Just a beggar. An insolent rascal who claimed to know you, mum. Did the beggar have a name? Why, yes, mum. Ishmael, I think it was. But he was almost at the corner when he heard the, ha- the sound of shouting and someone fast approaching behind him. Ishmael, is it really you? You have two eyes. Gertrude said you only had one. Uh, you know Gertrude? She has become my dearest friend. I found when she was searching for you. I, I looked for you at once. Th- there- there's so much. Shall we return to the house? Maybe better discuss things there. And inside the mansion, they sat like strangers in chairs that faced each other. Uh, may I ask to wash? Of course, I should have suggested it immediately. And then she decides to give him clothes, so it gets all, gets all fancied up. And finally she says, my, my name is Serena. Sugali's ghost had followed its master as far as the garden. Sugali let himself be deluded by time so that no one saw him crouching among the energetic growth and high containing walls. So we have Sugali... Uh, creeping around after Ishmael. Um, and we know he's after something, right? We know what he's after, the bow. But Ishmael padded softly down the hallway and found her in her favorite room, drinking golden wine from a long stem glass. And she looked at his face and how the scars around his eyes seemed to gather his features together at that point, giving it a bunch squint. His nose was a little worse for wear. The straight line of it veered a little between loose folds and taut stretchings. But apart from this, it was the normal face of a slender young man who looked as though he had lived a troubled and weather-beaten life. So, I don't know. Either Nebsuel does great work, or Serena is just blind to it, right? You like that? You like that pun there? But Serena and Ishmael had not stepped outside the house for almost a week because, you know, they're, they're just in love with each other. They're smitten. They never left each other talking and touching and succumbing to their courtship through the hours of the day and night. So this is another frustrating thing about this book is that that would have been such a great way to um, uh, have their, 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 their love or their attraction or whatever it may be develop, right, through an actual scene. But why are we getting an exposition? I don't know, man. It's absolutely unfortunate and boring. So powerful was their love in the house that it evaporated all gossip and below stairs speculation. So again, more exposition. The bow lay neglected in the hall. Ooh, that's what Sungali wanted. But under a nearby bush, Sungali's ghost dozed peacefully. I guess go sleep. Oh, yeah, that's right. He said they, uh, they have a unique kind of slumber. So they might travel together into the waiting worlds. But their arrival of a letter dislodged the peace of the house. My dear friend, have you forsaken me? This is from Gertrude because she's pregnant and she's alone. And uh, Serena has uh, been a little bit selfish, let's say. She's, she's been spending far too much time with Ishmael. 
Please, if I have not offended you in some unknown way, come to me soon. I need your strength and friendship to see me through these desperate times. Serena was mortified. She had not considered Gertrude's needs for days. What is the significance of this doctor? Ishmael asks. Uh, he was one of the men who paid, we paid to find you. He, he was a vile man, corrupt and dangerous. Uh, he ran off somewhere with the other vermin who tricked us. And she says she's going to see Gertrude. And Ishmael says, I am coming to see Gertrude. They arrived at Four Cooler Brun and minutes later, she rattled at the gate and the bell. But when a disheveled Gertrude eventually came to the gate, the sight of her friend unhooked her and she immediately began to weep. I'm so sorry for deserting you. Please forgive me. It will never happen again. We have been locked up in conversation that all else faded. We? Ishmael? Yes, Gertrude, I have come back. Much changed. The three of them stood, worldless, welded into a silent tableau that slowly softened and flowed through the yard and into the house. Mooter was arriving as they got to the front door. And who was this new boy, and what did he want with his lady? So, another... Another weird thing. I mean, are you telling me that Ishmael looks that different and it's that convincing that, uh, uh, you know, he is not r recognizing his, his build, his height, his something, right? I mean, to me, he doesn't look like a different person. I think it mentioned somewhere that his hair grew a little bit longer to his shoulders, but it hasn't been that long, has it? I, I don't think so. It's just, this is a lot of weird stuff like this in this book. Their conversation was long. Serena and Ishmael did their utmost to conceal their intimacy. Gertrude and Serena did not speak of the baby. So these two horn dogs, they're just, they can't, they can't stop it. But he had mated with both women and in each one's other company. Both felt possessive and maternal about him in very different ways and to varying degrees. Serena ached to be closer to him, to touch him, be touched, touched again. But Ishmael sensed the women's hunger and felt suffocated by it. Oh, poor Ishmael. You got two women after you. Jeez. Uh, ladies, will you excuse me for a short while? He immediately bounded up the wide stairs to where his room had been. His room was unlocked and unchanged. He touched the bed and opened the wardrobe to see his history hanging there. What will you tell him? I don't know. Nothing will be known until the birth. We are becoming very good at saying nothing. Serena agreed in silence. And in the attic, he opened the shutter into the breeze in the courtyard below, leaning out to get a better view. He climbed under the tower and opened the swiveling eye of the camera obscura, observing the activity below, changing lenses to see inside it. He remembered watching her confusion turn to annoyance, then transform into abandonment and eventually satisfaction. He recalled the same transformation himself, only in reverse. So this is when um, he's kind of reflecting on things. And I don't know. I feel like if he's reflecting on things, he should feel kind of bad for how he acted, but it doesn't really seem that way. And I understand he's been through a lot, but he kind of just changed quickly, I guess, which there was really no explanation for it. And I, I don't know. I fail to believe it is, you know, teen angst or whatever it is. I think it should have been internalized to a degree for us as the readers to kind of see where he's coming from because so many, again, so many character acts in this book did not feel realistic, right? It just felt like it went from one thing to the other in, in the blink of an eye without the normal progression or complications you see when two people interact with each other. You, you mean to intend to live together as man and wife? Do you really feel so much for him? You hardly know each other. What about his past? I've told you something of his dubious origin. Doesn't that concern you? Indeed, there, this is what I mean. There's just not to say, you know, love is logical or anything like that or emotions are logical, but it's just, it's weird. It's too much crammed into a small space without breathing room. There are many things I have not told you yet. I don't want the details about how I made love to you. Not that. Things before any of this happened. Ah, yes, the mysterious teachers who lived in the basement, those that you saved him from. You mean they might be still living down there? They weren't human. They were machines, puppet-like machines. He was tightening the strings, softly strumming them to adjust their pitch. The task gave him a place to think and recollect. Serena's jaw was hanging in astonishment. Gertrude had told her everything in great detail. On the way home, Ishmael tried to gently quiz Serena about their friend. He wanted the core of Gertrude's reaction to know which way her thick waters flowed. She begged exhaustion, promising to speak about it later. The ancient ghost, Singali's grandfather, tapped his dozing grandson. You will sleep yourself to nothing. It is time to wake and thicken. She is troubled and moving, shrugging rags off. You must gather yourself. He knew the bow longed to be naked, her every fiber straining towards meaning. If he could, he would take her back, carrying her into the vor. She needed to be given there before rage and insanity consumed her. 
Zungali arose and slipped away toward the house. He knelt before the bow, speaking to her in gentle, respectful tones. Great sister, I am of your own people, a common warrior who wants only to obey. It is my wish to lift you and carry you in your journey. There was no response. The bow remained still. A single arrow was left in the vacant quiver, however, though. His slow grandfather turned toward him and immediately sprang back. His mouth opened and a thunderous, ethereal roar emanated soundlessly from him. He's pretty pissed about the bow action. It is you. It is you. You are the final one. Sungali's arms were one with the bow. He placed the warped arrow against the bowstring, pointed up over the wall in the direction of the vor. We've been here, folks, with Mr. One of the Williams. But his grandfather matching his every step, the final bowman left the house. Together, they walked the path of the... So what does this mean? What does this mean? Does this mean that... Um, I don't know. Uh, we know that one of the Williams, he dies. And um, I don't know. It's just all weird, man. This, this book is so weird. There, there's no logical completions of, of arcs or, or storylines or anything like of the sort. So I was hoping something would resolve itself at the end. But alas, unfortunately, it did not. The first stabs of illness returned to the horses and waking dreams made Mybridge relinquish his demands of his homeland. He would retire. Five men and a horse waited on his commands as they, as the cold air and the light streamed in from the tall open doors at one end of the hollow building. Her Majesty's men had made him a replica of his previous studio where he could photograph what he wanted without anybody knowing. It must be white, pure white, he had told them, preferably with a flowing mane. He was ready to make a picture that the world had never seen. The signal was given. The man outside whipped the horse hard into a stampede. The horse bolted between them into the glaring disembodied light of the fathomless hall that has all these grids and stuff on it. But the horse collapsed onto its running legs, sending up a cloud of black swirling dust, its thrashing body digging into the white grid and splattering the walls from the exit wound of its spine. So this is the photo Mybridge wanted to capture, I guess, dead horse, something like that. Mybridge entered the lightless room out of focus and red. So this is when he starts to develop these pictures and he's satisfied with them. And here we are. Uh, no further questions were proffered or answered. His last two names were misspellings. Edward Mybridge, written in the crematorium register. Edward Maybridge, carved into the stone that marked his ashes. He's dead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, honestly, whether or not his inventions sort of make sense in book two or book three, I don't care because we needed more than this, Cowling. We needed more than this, my friend. Uh, this is just unsatisfactory, in my opinion. Which brings us to chapter 34. On the night of their return from Ishmael's reunion with Gertrude, they made a strange mating. Here we go, mating again. Ishmael did not notice that Sungali and the bow had gone because, you know, he's, he's more concerned with other things right now. Serena visited Gertrude once a week. She took care to do it alone, though. Gertrude was regaining her strength, that confident energy that had so defined her from the first day in the world. Since she had told Serena about the incident with the kin, she realized her memory of it had changed, as if sharing her story had given her space to reflect and see it from different angles. Their actions appeared to have a calmness, care, and purpose, rather than the cruel mechanical coldness she had so aut automatically and fearfully interpreted. Three days earlier, Gertrude had enlisted Serena's support and made the difficult journey to her parents' home to tell them about her pregnancy. Did not go very well. Uh, sit down, please. Uh, the truth is, I'm at the end of my tether. The business is dying and our savings have gone. The only thing we can do is take what we have and leave. Anyway, my daughter, let's talk about you. What is this important news that you brought to us today? So his business is failing. The family's got to get the hell out. And he wasn't too happy about this. A three-day sensor visit should have given Gertrude time to get used to the idea of her family's upheaval. But she could not erase the image of her father's anger at her news. I mean, of course, of course, right? Big surprise. But anyway, the white envelope had not been there before. So another white envelope. G.E. Tulp. Uh, you have performed beyond my hopes. Your conduct and intelligence in all matters has been ex excellent, and you shall be rewarded. You will stay in this house and bring your child up in its safe confines. Help will be offered to you because she's got another baby, uh, baby cyclops in her belly. Ishmael now has his own life and will be left alone to use it. I will contact you again after the birth. So this mysterious <coughs> person right here uh, is okay that uh, Ishmael has gone on to do his own thing. Because he's got a new Cyclops baby. And I don't know. I guess we'll see where that goes. Serena sat on the balcony looking out at the city, beyond the city walls, to the distant Vor. Ishmael 
brought her a glass of wine and gently laid her hand on her shoulder. Gertrude's hands were damp, and she was flushed with the child as she walked through the echoing empty hall. She walked over to the basement door and unlocked it. She entered the next room and was somehow unsurprised to see Luluwa, Luluwa's back, sitting on the crate that had laid open since Gertrude's last visit. But something is strange about Luluwa. You are the one that broke Abel, Luluwa said in her high sing-song voice. Yes, I hear the squalling of the movement. The child sucks at your interior and thrashes with its limbs. Two eyes of cunning observation adorned her face surrounded by scars, as if the sockets and lids had been smeared with a hot knife. So she's kind of transformed to be like Ishmael. Not only is her face twisted, we find out that she's taller as well. We will be your servants now, said Luluwal. I and the remaining kin will be teachers to the child. I did not mean to kill him. But Luluwa had grown and stood looking at her shoulder to shoulder and eye to eye. So Luluwa's grown. She's got weird, jacked up two eyes now. Um, I'm guessing this is representative of not only Ishmael's transformation, but what the baby is going to look like. It's going to be pretty freaky. I mean, I think that's probably the most interesting aspect of this entire novel, honestly, is the strange... Um, you know, uh, automatons in this basement who were raising a cyclops for, we have no reason whatsoever, not even a hint of a reason. And that's one of the big frustrating things about this book for me is that uh, there's so many, so many uh, ties that are just unresolved. So many uh, storylines. I, again, I, I don't think they need to be resolved completely, but give me something more, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. It just, for 500 pages, that's a long, that's a decent, decently sized novel. I feel like there's just really not much to hold on to in this book. The figure at the crossroads tensed his muscles and drew himself up to full height. There would be no passing this day. In, in his altered condition, Sidrius had taken weeks to circumnavigate the outskirts and reach the point of interception. But Sidrius had not reached the violent time. The Mithrasia had begun to thrive before it had even reached the outskirts of the city. And when Sidrius had the knowledge of the war and was properly healed, he would return and slowly split the medicine man apart. The contents of the bottle had stopped the horror from finishing him, but his body was a shattered wreck. And this is when he runs to the bowman, who stopped, as if jarred by the sight of him. Come closer, friend. I mean you no harm. William stepped closer to the insatiable hunger. You no longer carry your bow. Bow? The living bow that guided you for years. I have no knowledge of these things. I think you are speaking to the wrong person. You can trust me. I have done much to protect you. You have enemies and adversaries who do not want your passing through the war again. I don't know what you are talking about. About the possession wars? I mean you no offense, but what you speak of holds no meaning for me. I have the dimmest recollection of a forest destroyed, broken stumps of hacked roots, a place of mud and death, illuminated by thunder and lightning that tore men into pieces. But that was a long time ago far from where we now stand. The pistol clicked into the gear and he swung it up because he anticipates Sidrius is up to something. But before he could commit to a shot, Sidrius bounded across the space between them, arcing one of the sticks up and over, slicing it through the tendons of William's arm. Yep. He's not dead yet, folks, but it's, it's getting there. But when he came to, it was darker. The shadow which seemed to construct the room he was in smelt rank. He was held in some sort of constraint. He recalled the tiny chapel behind the figure, in the, at the crossroads. He had been tied to a simple altar. I mean to have my answers from you today. I will not tolerate any more of your foolishness. The purposeful torturer attached a tourniquet to William's upper thigh. Not a drop of your precious blood will be wasted. By the time I finish, it will exceed the organs it has so faithfully served. He did not know how many times he had passed out or how many times he had come to. New agonies awaited him with every breath. He felt something far outside the chapel, searching him out, rushing to his side. The whistle outside was shrill and fast, only moments away. William saw the voice from the corner of his eye. It flashed wide in the window for a fraction of a second, and he recognized it as the first arrow, the one that Este had made for him. He almost smiled before it sliced through his throat, pinning his words to the altar. Sidrius sprang back in a shower of blood. The Sidrius slumped backwards, defeated and dejected. Williams has been killed by his own arrow, but the arrow fell loose as though it had merely been resting there, and Sidrius runs toward the forest. He dropped the sack of tools and made straight for the core. A great arc formed and glided down from the clouds on the forest floor. It was another arrow, old, white, and twisted. 
Sugali disregarded the mangled presence of the chapel. The old man pulled the arrow they had shot from Serena's garden out of its parched gray skin, being poor Williams. The distorted covering fell away like parchment and revealed what had once been a human hand, the first human hand. So does this mean that Williams is Adam? I don't know, man. I don't know, guys. From the moment the arrow left the bow, followed on its journey by the duo of earnest spirits, Sidrius' vision started to fail. So we have reached the epilogue, the final, final, final thing. And we're in Belgium, 1961. So I believe this is like, what, 30 years later, something like that. The streets are livid with bright cars. They seem to run at the same speed as their horns. The American poet looks at his map once again. He arrives at the entrance of the public nursing home, and he enters. A Moroccan woman in a stained, threadbare uniform of blue and white takes him through the old house. Madame Dufresne, your visitor, is here. Uh, Madame Dufresne, good morning. Please allow me to introduce myself. Charlotte listens. Charlotte, being the Frenchman's um, little companion. Uh, she listens and smiles kindly at the incorrect precision of his French. For the next hour, he asks endless questions about the Frenchman. Is it true that he could not sleep in his bed? That he had fear of falling from it? Do you have any pictures of your time together? And she does. She produces a dog-eared photograph. They are posed like a married couple. She seated, him standing behind her chair. Her kindness radiates, even lending beauty to her startling hat, which resembles the neck of a dead inverted swan. The American is mem mesmerized. This is the best image of his literary hero he has ever seen. It shows a taut, immaculate man of precise, if diminutive, proportion. This is wonderful. Truly wonderful. And he asks if they can meet again. And they meet four times more. On the last occasion, he visits her in her own room in the elegant private nursing home that houses her final days in peaceful dignity. So even Charlotte is gone. But like a disappointing conjuring trick, the chocolates had transformed into a book. She stared at it as he adjusted his spectacles. I thought you would like this. It's just been published, the latest edition. And what is this book? Well, the book was in English. Its title sounded more emphatic that way. Impressions of Africa. Yes, the um, the very book that uh, the, the Frenchman Roussel, I believe, uh, wrote in, in the real life. But she would never read it, not in English. She never read it in French. That brings us to the end, everybody. The end of the war. So I guess I'll get my thoughts out. Uh, don't worry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create an, an official review that will be... Uh, Hopefully a more collected version of what's rolling around in my head. But uh, a couple things. First and foremost, there's not really much story here. So I read books to experience stories. Uh, I will give Catlin credit that he has a wild imagination. Uh, he pulls a lot from reality, which honestly, or history, I should say, which isn't, I'm not really a fan of that. I don't particularly, I guess, dislike it, but... If used in a clever way, I can respect it. I don't feel like it was used in a clever way here. My bridge being the perfect example of a complete waste of time, um, of my time, of your time perhaps, unless you really liked his scenes. But uh, yeah, he's great at creating interesting characters, I guess, but characters that, that's kind of where it, where it ends. Um, their actions aren't very interesting. Uh, their reactions aren't very interesting. And so it makes me wonder uh, if he really thought this through completely because they, while, while distinct, while colorful, while creative, while full of detail, these characters never really felt real, real to me. And I think uh, the reason being is that they never reacted for the most part to very pivotal moments in this novel, like I feel like real people would. You know, when, um, when uh, Peter Williams gives the bow, he just hands it to Ishmael like no big deal. I didn't really get a a moment there, uh, just after that fact, once he let the bow go, he uh, he started forgetting, kind of, right? He let her go. He was detached from 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 Este, which is strange because I, I love the way this novel began, right? It had such a great uh, beginning uh, chapter, introducing him, making the bow from her body, uh, to me signifying that he would be that you know more or less the main character in this novel. Uh, he was kind of. Um, the person that was carrying us through this and, and everybody, not, I shouldn't say everybody, but a lot of characters were surrounding him. So we had, uh, Ishmael ran into him. Sugali was hunting him. Uh, Sid Reeves was trying to protect him. Uh, Nebzuel kind of got involved to a degree, at least, you know, peripherally. But, um, his story seemed to be his own. It seems to be rooted in this mythology or this history of this forest. But again, we just, we weren't, I wasn't given enough to really hold on to it. You know, it's 
Um, my interest was peaked here and there, but the way it ended was severely disappointing. And, you know, I can respect it. I, I like I like the concept of things uh, not going the way you expect them to go. Like, let's take The Last of Us 2. Um, <laughs> so not, not, not from the player's perspective. If you haven't played it, the story kind of ends like on a really low note. Um, and, and I feel like a lot of part or a big part of stories like that is the whole point is that things don't always work out how you want, right? You don't get the happy ending. You don't get the, uh, cathartic ending, uh, uh, meanings. Sometimes there's no meaning in something. Sometimes you go on this long journey and, um, it just falls apart and, and but you still kind of are like struggling on to, or you're holding on to the hope that, that, um, this is a worthwhile venture, right? So I can respect that kind of storytelling. This is not that kind of storytelling. This is not the kind of storytelling that um, exists to uh, build up your expectations and then kind of subvert them in a way uh, that um, just communicates the idea or the theme that, you know, um, meaning or, or what you think there might be meaning behind is, is, is meaningless, essentially. Story didn't do that. Um, I, I felt like these characters were just, you know, sloppily thrown together, um, um, uh, reacting in a sloppy way. Uh, nothing felt even Sungali, Sungali's death, and then he turns into a ghost to, to complete the, the journey with the bowman, or, or becoming the bowman, essentially. Um, I don't know. There, I, I understand that, you know, like I said earlier, sometimes we try to emulate reality, right? The, the, the fact that reality is is not fair, right? A lot of times, you know, when we're when we're crafting a story, we, we're trying to tell real stories, but not real, if that makes sense, right? We're, we're trying to uh, create real characters, but they're they're not real. They're they're always stylized. They, they don't ever have the the hundred percent the the depth of a real person because there's just not that much to capture on the page. But we try to get close enough to create a stylized version of reality, um, and then you know make a commentary on that reality. But it just didn't work for me here. And, and like I said, you have you have Mybridge, completely pointless character. Maybe the devices or the technologies he he invented in this book are going to matter uh, in subsequent books. But again, you got you still got to give me something to hang on to. So the, the one thing that I think was the most interesting part of this entire novel, uh, the way it concluded, I should say, was how when Gertrude finally you know got the courage to go back down into the basement where she found Ishmael, she finds Luluwa uh, changed to much as he has. And now that she's pregnant, uh, she <laughs> she's kind of been handed the baton, right? The, the torch, um, so to speak, to, to carry on this this mysterious person's um, cyclops raising. I, I have no idea, but that's that was kind of the only interesting thing in the entire novel, honestly. Uh, the mythology, I didn't get really enough to sink my teeth into, uh, because again, for me, uh, this was a fantastic exercise in world building, but I don't I don't read books for that. I, I would read a encyclopedia if I wanted to read about worlds, right? I think world building is definitely essential in a novel, but it shouldn't be the only thing. Uh, it, it's strange because I feel like with a, a really good editor, um, this book could have been really something interesting. With something, uh, if Catlin focused more on character motivation reactions. It, you know, it could have really resonated with me, I think, because it's one of those books that it's strange because it, it's well written, it's creative, it has an interesting world, right, where these characters exist, but it doesn't amount to anything. And part of me wonders if, uh, well, Catlin, you know, he was a poet, so he's not a novelist by trade. He has written novels, yes, but it doesn't seem like he was really steeped into the in the craft of, of fiction because... This feels like he was having a great time creating uh, characters and places, but not really a story, you know? Um, and, and I think that, you know, maybe this trilogy should have been one big fat book. Maybe then it makes sense because, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm a firm believer that any length of series, trilogy, you know, 10 book series, whatever it is, every book needs to have some kind of conclusion. It doesn't have to conclude the entire story, obviously, but you have to answer some questions. I don't know. I, I guess that's a good way to put it. Like what questions were answered here? I don't think any of the questions the novel posed were answered yet. Not a single one, right? You think about um, uh, Ishmael's origins, not answered. 
Uh, you think about uh, Mybridge, what he was doing here, not answered. You think about Gertrude just hanging out in Essenwald, and I guess she's playing her part, you know, being a the mother to this this the Cyclops baby. But uh, even even you know uh, Sungali who set out to get revenge, like the way that ended was really weird. He's just kind of like, okay, uh, yeah, I'm cool with it. Um, I almost got my I got my hand blown off, and yeah, I guess Ishmael, you're my master now. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know. But I'll, I'll try to collect my thoughts for the final review, but um, I would love to hear yours um, if you made it this far. Hopefully you're you're still here with me. At least hopefully one person is still with me. Uh, Britton, I know you are. And I know you like this book, so we definitely uh, have diverged in our in our opinions. But um, I guess that's it. That's the end of the VOR. Um, uh, this was a frustrating book for me many times. There, there, there were great, great things about it, but... But it just never came together. It never came together. But I appreciate your time. I appreciate you hanging out with me, reading along with me. And let's hope the next one is a better one. And I'm, I'm looking forward to creating a video which will be out probably the day after this one. So keep your eyes peeled. And again, if you would like to uh, throw your book into the ring, your, your book to be voted on on YouTube, then please join my Discord. It's always free. The, uh, the link is in the description. All right. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.